What's up, everybody? JT Sports here, back at you guys with another episode of the JT Sports Podcast. On this episode, we're going to be discussing why the Miami Hurricanes football program will finally win the ACC championship this year, why Tennessee football will explode this season, how good will the Cincinnati Bengals defense be, and lastly, why Houston Texans fans should be excited about rookie running back Damian Pierce. Now, if this is your first time listening to the JT Sports Podcast, welcome. I appreciate you for tuning in. Make sure that you follow me on all of my social media pages. You can follow me on Instagram at JT Sports underscore and on Twitter at JT Sports underscore underscore. Also, if you haven't already, make sure that you are subscribed to my YouTube channel, which is JT Sports. So ever since I was a freshman in high school, I've been saying that Miami was going to win the ACC championship, and it never has happened. And now, the year 2022, I went from being a freshman in high school to now a junior in college, and I have yet to see my beloved Hurricanes win any kind of championship. The closest I have been to witnessing the Miami Hurricanes football program winning the ACC was when they got destroyed by Clemson in the championship game a couple of years ago led by quarterback Malik Rozier but this season I'm going all out there I believe that this is finally going to be the year that the Hurricanes finally not only win the Coastal but win the ACC and for some people out there they may say, oh, here you go, JT, here you go, drinking that Kool-Aid. Well, I got some Kool-Aid right here. I'm drinking all the Kool-Aid, ladies and gentlemen. Mario Christenball, I did not believe that he was going to leave Oregon for Miami, but it happened. And he has assembled one of the best coaching staffs in all of college football. You have offensive coordinator Josh Gaddis, who just was the OC for Michigan, who, let's not forget, they were just in the college football playoffs. He was a large reason for that. You have co-defensive coordinators Charlie Strong and Kevin Still. Doesn't get no better than that. This is a really fantastic coaching staff that Mario Cristobal has put together. On top of that, you have Tyler Van Dyke at quarterback, one of the best quarterbacks in all of college football. Last season, he threw for 2,939 pass yards, 25 touchdowns, 6 interceptions, while completing 62.3% of his passes. And to be honest with you, when Tyler Van Dyke first took over at quarterback, I was a little bit iffy about him. He was a little bit inconsistent. He had some good moments. He had some low moments, but... He got better as the season progressed. We literally saw Tyler Van Dyke mature in over the span of one season. So with Josh Gaddis at the helm at OC, I expect Tyler Van Dyke to take a really big leap this season. On top of that, Miami has one of the deepest running back rooms in all of college football. You have Henry Parrish, Ole Miss transfer, Jalen Knighton, Thad Franklin, Number 22 from the spring game. Please go back and watch the spring game if you haven't already. Because this was my favorite player from Miami spring game. He's 240 pounds and he's a tank. He's not the most elusive. He's not the fastest. But he's a north-south runner. He's going to get the ball. He's going to hit the hole. And he's going to look to run through somebody and put somebody on on her you-know-what. I'm really excited about what this Hurricanes team can do this year. I really am. And this is one of the most talented teams in all of the ACC. And it's not like Miami hasn't had talent on their team in the past. Miami has pretty much recruited pretty well. And the fact that it has taken so long for Miami to win the ACC championship is really surprising to me. Because talent hasn't really been the issue it's really been the coaching. You have Mario Christian Ball, who is an established coach. He's won at Oregon. He's had success in some of the biggest games. So with him coming to Miami, I'm expecting him to get this thing rolling right away. 
it shouldn't take two to three years for Miami to be contending at a elite level. Miami should at least be able to win 10 games, win the ACC, and then be able to make it to a New Year's Six Bowl game. And I don't want to hear the excuses about, oh, JT is going to take some time. I saw Mel Tucker leave Colorado for Michigan State. And in just one season, Michigan State went from being the bottom of the barrel to being in the New Year's Six Bowl game. I don't want to hear no excuses. There are so many coaches who have turned around programs in the span of one year. And then when you look at the fact that we have the transfer portal now, with players being able to transfer and having immediate eligibility, there's no reason why the Hurricanes should not be able to win the ACC. And as a matter of fact, this is probably one of the best opportunities that Miami is going to have to win the ACC in recent memory. Clemson has a lot of question marks. They have a lot to prove. NC State. NC State's a really good football team. But let's be honest. Miami should be able to beat the NC State. Not trying to be disrespectful to the Wolfpack fans out there. I'm just calling it how it is. Wake Forest? Come on, man. Miami should be able to beat the Wake Forests of the world in the NC States. And they should be able to contend and get right with a school like Clemson. As a matter of fact, they should be able to beat Clemson. Clemson has a lot of question marks. Now, I'm not saying that Miami doesn't have any question marks. All I'm trying to say is that Miami is just a talented football team that has been held back by lackluster coaching. No offense to Manny Diaz. I love you, Manny. I will always respect what Manny Diaz attempted to do as the head coach for the Miami Hurricanes. Manny tried. He really did. Every offseason, he went out there, made changes. There are a lot of head coaches who are really stubborn. They don't really attempt to make changes. Manny did. So I will always have respect for Manny and what he attempted to do with the Miami Hurricanes football program. But Miami needed more. Miami kept bringing in coaches that were good to give you seven, eight wins a year. But with the Hurricanes, they need somebody who's going to take them to that next level. Who's going to be that coach to really bring back the U? Because for years, it seems like Miami has been stuck at this level. They've been stuck at a level where people now start to view Miami as pretty much an average football program. And this football program has so much potential in that. And I'm really happy that the Miami University decided to take it upon themselves and finally dish out some big-time money to get a big-time hire. So with Mario Christenball here, the offensive line is going to be really good. He used to play on the offensive line during his time for the Canes. So he should be having this offensive line coached up. This should be one of the best units in the ACC. On top of that, the tight end position is really good. Will Mallory was having a really fantastic spring until he got injured. With him coming back in the fold, I expect him to have a really good season 2021 was kind of a letdown for Will Mallory. He kind of struggled a little bit this year with how much momentum he gathered in the spring. Hopefully that translates well into the summer and into fall camp and then hopefully into the regular season. A big question that many people are probably going to have who are not Hurricane fans is going to be the wide receiver position because Miami did lose Mike Harley and Charleston Rambo. However, you have Keyshawn Smith. Keyshawn Smith caught 33 passes for 405 yards, three touchdowns. You have Xavier Restrepo, who is going to be in the slot. He's one of the better slot receivers in all of college football. Then you have... A couple of unproven guys who have potential, they have good size. It's just that you don't really know what you're going to get when they're on the field. Jacoby George, many people inside of the program are excited about him. You have Frank Latson. There are some really good football programs in this wide receiver room that many people probably aren't going to be familiar with until the season starts. In the offensive line, like I mentioned earlier, I'm expecting this offensive line to play at a really elite level with Mario Christian Ball specializing in the offensive line department. So if you specialize in something, it should be really good. So hopefully the offensive line ends up playing as well as what I hope it will. 
Two offensive linemen that I'm really excited about this year is offensive tackle Zion Nelson. Last year around this time, Zion Nelson had first round NFL hype. He was projected to be one of the first offensive tackles taken. However, last season, things didn't really pan out the way many had hoped. He ended up coming back. You have offensive guard Jalen Rivers, who I like a lot. So there is a lot of talent on this Miami Hurricanes offense. With Josh Gaddis, he put a lot of emphasis. He brings this power spread offense, but... I'm not really sure he's going to run the exact same offense in Miami that he did with Michigan because a good offensive coordinator always tailors the offense to the strength of their personnel. So the personnel that he had in Michigan may be a little bit more different compared to what he's working with with Miami, which is why he may end up changing his philosophy. On top of that, he has a way better quarterback in Tyler Van Dyke compared to what he had in Michigan with Kay McNamara. No offense to Kay McNamara, he's a pretty solid quarterback, but he's not somebody who's going to go out there and get it done in crunch time. He's not somebody who's going to elevate your offense in a sense. He's more of a game manager is what McNamara was, similar to an agent McCarron. There's nothing wrong with having a game manager at quarterback. Stetson Bennett won a championship for UGA this past year being a game manager. But for Tyler Van Dyke, he's one of the best quarterbacks in college football. So I would expect that he has way more opportunities with the ball in his hands compared to what Cade had with UM last season then the defense this defense led by Cole DC's Charlie Strong and Kevin Still the defensive line has a lot of talent and it is super deep you have a couple of returning players who I'm high on and you also have some key transfers who you got in the transfer portal which I'm not going to name them all because we'll be sitting here all day but I do like Leonard Taylor and Chance Williams. They both had two and a half sacks each last year. I'm expecting Leonard Taylor to have a seven or eight sack season because he was highly touted coming out of high school. Miami Hurricanes fans were really excited when he ended up committing to the Canes. Me too. So I'm expecting him to do big things this year. You also have some transfer portal guys who I like a lot, like West Virginia transfer Daryl Jackson. Well, Daryl Jackson is coming from Maryland, but you have Akeem Mesador from West Virginia also. So those are a couple of transfers that I really like a lot. Then you have safeties, Avante Williams and James Williams. This may be one of the best safety tandems, not only in the ACC, but in college football. James Williams, I believe he led the team in interceptions last season. Great size, great length, incredible athlete, future first round pick written all over him. Same thing with Avante Williams. He's also a stud as well. Then at the cornerback room, you have Tyreek Stevenson, Takori Couch, DJ, DJ Ivy. There are some really good football players on this Hurricanes roster. And that's why I feel really confident about making the claim that the Hurricanes are going to win the ACC. There's no reason why Miami shouldn't win the ACC this year. There's really no reason why Miami shouldn't have been competing for the ACC in years past because the Coastal has been down, aside from a couple of teams who have risen up to the occasion. However, there's just so many teams this year in the Coastal that have question marks. And not just the Coastal, but the whole entire conference as a whole. So for the Hurricanes, with Mario Cristobal being in the mix, he's one of the best coaches in college football, great recruiter. He has assembled a really good staff. I don't see why... Miami shouldn't be winning this conference this year. We saw Mel Tucker and what he did with Michigan State in only one year. There's no reason why we shouldn't be able to see Mario Cristobal do the same thing with the Hurricanes. So you guys let me know what you guys think about the Miami Hurricanes this season. Do you feel that they will win the ACC championship? I know a lot of you guys are probably going to push back on it, but I feel really strong in my Hurricanes this year. They let me down pretty much every year. But I think that this is finally going to be the year that he put everything together and that they end up actually being able to compete for a championship and maybe potentially winning the conference, which I believe will happen. I've been a Miami Hurricane fan since I first started watching college football, and I have never witnessed this team win a championship. You know what I have to do to watch the Miami Hurricanes compete for championships? 
either do it myself on NCAA 14 or go back and watch old replays from 2002 and 2004 and whatnot. So for me, as a fan, I would love to see this team actually win something in my lifetime and not just a petty bowl game. I want to see Miami be in a New Year's Six bowl game. I'm not expecting college football playoffs. I'm not expecting this team to go undefeated. All I'm saying is that I'm expecting this team to win the ACC. And believe it or not, that's not me having overly high expectations considering the fact that the ACC is regarded as one of the worst Power 5 conferences in college football. So you have NC State. You have Wake Forest. You're going to have Clemson who's going to be in the mix. There's no reason why Miami isn't capable of being able to beat those teams, especially Clemson. Clemson has so many concerns. When you look at their coaching staff, many people are looking at Dabble Sweeney. He's going to have a big magnifying glass on him this year. Heck, Clemson doesn't really even have consistent play from the quarterback position. And that's one of the most important positions in all of college football. If you have a great quarterback, you're able to win at least eight games. So Mario Christian Ball having pretty much the best quarterback in this conference, that should be a guaranteed eight games. And another thing, when it came to the Hurricanes under Manny Diaz, there were many games that came down to one possession. And the reason why Miami lost some of those games was due to poor time management. You had some situations where the field goal kicker ended up missing on a couple of game-winning field goals, which he never should have been put in those situations anyway because Miami should have went ahead and scored and sealed the game. So with a better head coach who is better at managing those kind of late-game situations, that's going to help Miami because for many Diaz, he wasn't a bad coach. As a matter of fact, I think he was better than Al Golden. Don't know if I would put him over Mark Rick, but he was definitely better than Al Golden, in my opinion. The thing that really hurt Manny is simply for the fact that he wasn't really good in those late game situations. And that's what happens when you have an inexperienced head coach who's learning on the job. Mario Christian Ball isn't learning on the job. We have a head coach who is established, a head coach who understands how to manage these situations, a head coach who has played in several big games, a head coach who has played in title games and came up on top in them. So if anybody comes out and says that my expectations are too high, I want to tell you to go back and watch Michigan State under Mel Tucker. They got a couple of guys in the transfer portal, had everybody buy in, and they went to a New Year's Six Bowl game. Although they didn't win the Big Ten, the Big Ten is a whole different animal compared to the ACC. I don't think I really need to explain that. However, ACC championship is my expectations for the Miami Hurricanes this year. Hopefully they don't let me down. But if Miami doesn't win the ACC championship, I'm not going to say this season was a disappointment. If Miami's able to win 10 games, I'll be happy. Hopefully they win 10 games plus the ACC championship. I don't see no reason why they can't. But you guys let me know how you guys are feeling about the Miami Hurricanes football program down in the comment section down below. The Vols last season finished 7-6. And this was a program that I am really excited to watch this year. You have Hendon Hooker coming back at quarterback. You guys already know how I feel about Hendon Hooker this season. Either he wins Heisman Well, nobody else does. He's one of the best quarterbacks in all of college football. Last year for Tennessee, he threw for 2,945 passing yards, 31 touchdowns to three interceptions while completing 68.2% of his passes. He also ran for 620 rushing yards and five rushing touchdowns. He is a big reason why I am so high on the volunteers going into this upcoming college football season. You also have leading rusher Jabari Small returning. He could quietly become one of the better backs in America. Last year, he had 140 carries for 792 rushing yards, averaged 5.7 yards per attempt, and had nine touchdowns. You also return your leading wide receiver, Cedric Tillman, who had 64 receptions for 1,081 receiving yards, 12 touchdowns, and he averaged 16.9 yards per reception. And Cedric Tillman has the potential to become the best wide receiver in the conference because there are definitely a lot of talented wide receivers, but 
when you look at Cedric Tillman, the fact that he returns, he could have left for the NFL. He has really good size. Plus, him and Hendon Hooker already have a really good connection. This is probably going to be one of the best quarterback wide receiver tandems that we have in all of college football this year. Then you have USC transfer Brew McCoy, who was a former five star coming out of high school. Great size. He's 6'3, 220 pounds. He kind of reminds me a little bit of Drake London in a sense. They similar. They have similar body builds and structure. And on top of that, he is a better athlete than what Drake London was. He can really run. And in Josh Heupel's offense, I believe that he can do some really big things. He could end up having a breakout season. Then you have slot receivers, Jalen Hewitt, who caught 21 passes, for 226 receiving yards, two touchdowns. Jimmy Callaway also is going to be in the mix. He's really explosive with the ball in his hands. You return both of your tight ends in Princeton, Fent, and Jacob Warren. Your defense is probably going to be the big question mark that everybody's going to have about Tennessee. This was one of the worst defenses in college football last year. You allowed 31.5 points per game, 97th worst in the country. You are 105th in yards per game allowed. But Honestly, with the style of offense that Tennessee runs being fast-paced, this defense isn't going to play at a high level. At best, this defense probably will finish top 60. So realistically, I'm not expecting the defense to be a world beat. I'm not expecting Tennessee to have a top 10 defense, and they don't need a top 10 defense to be able to compete. Who needs a defense when you can just outscore everybody? But I am looking for the Vols defense to be Really good situationally because no matter what, you're not going to win too many football games regardless how good your offense is. If you have one of the worst defenses in all of college football when it comes to getting off the field and third down situations. On top of that, this was a defense that not only was good, well, not only wasn't good on third down, but they were awful in the red zone. They allowed opposing teams to score touchdowns in the red zone 92% of the time. That's unacceptable. You know what that put them at? 121st in the country. And I don't even know what's even more worse. The fact that they couldn't get off the field in third down situations. Or the fact that they couldn't stop anybody in the red zone. But what's even worse is the fact that they didn't create a lot of turnovers. They were 104th in takeaways. So this defense has to play way better. And like I mentioned earlier. This isn't a defense that is going to be one of the best simply for the way the offense is ran. The offense is high paced. This offense is trying to score fast. They move the ball fast. So the defense is going to be on the field for a good amount of plays. However, there are certain aspects where this defense has to improve. And if you're going to be able to win in in the SEC, you're going to have to be able to do more than just offense. You're going to have to be able to come away with some key takeaways and big moments. You're going to have to be able to get some big sacks in third down situations. You do have edge rusher Byron Young returning five and a half sacks. If he can get the nine sacks, I think that would be really good. You also have linebacker Jeremy Banks who led the team in tackles last season. He had 128, 11 and a half tackles for loss. He also had five and a half sacks. Four pass deflections in an interception. I believe he could end up emerging as one of the best linebackers in this conference. A couple of other players on the Vols defense that I'm really excited to see. You have Brendan Turnich, who's going to be playing that star position, or he's expected to be getting a start at that star position. He won SEC Defensive Player of the Week against South Carolina when he had to fill in in replace of the injured starter at that time, Phil Jackson. He had 14 total tackles in that game, two tackles for loss. He's a former Alabama Crimson Tide transfer. At the time when he first transferred to Tennessee, Josh Heupel was really excited about him. It was a big get for him. He raved about him, and he's going to end up having a big role, I feel, in this Vols defense. You also have free safety Trayvon Flowers who is a senior. He is pretty much the Tennessee Vols best defensive back. 82 tackles, three pass deflections, and their interception last year. You also have Jalen McCullough who led the team in interceptions with three. He had five pass deflections, 49 tackles, a sack, and a forced fumble. So this is a secondary that the safety position I feel really confident in. 
I don't really know how good the cornerback play is going to be because the cornerback play is to be decided. Yeah, you have a couple of players who you got in the transfer portal. You have a couple of returning vets that are coming back. However, you don't really know the kind of performance that you're going to get out of the cornerback position this year, which is why I say I'm going to take more of a wait and see approach. However, this is a team that overall should be able to compete for the second best team in the SEC East. We know how good Georgia is going to be this year. Georgia, even though they did lose a lot of talent, they are replacing that talent with great talent you get what I'm saying I know that wasn't the best wording but teams like Alabama and Georgia they don't rebuild they just reload they have great players leave and have great players come in and fill those roles so for Georgia I still expect them to be the best team in the SEC East however I definitely feel that the Tennessee Volunteers can be competing for that second spot in the East along with Kentucky and maybe Florida. Some people may be sleeping on the Florida Gators, but the Florida Gators could surprise many people this year. However, I'm really high on Tennessee. When you have a star quarterback like a Hendon Hooker, if Hendon Hooker plays at a Heisman caliber level, that means Tennessee is going to have at least nine wins and maybe more. Maybe we could see Tennessee get to a New Year's Six Bowl game. However, another thing that I'm really excited to see, I want to see how Hendon Hooker performs against Georgia this year because Georgia was pretty much his worst performance and he didn't even play bad in that game. It's simply the fact that Tennessee just got rostered to death. And even if they do get rostered to death by Georgia, I think that Tennessee is capable of being able to put Georgia in a close game going into the fourth quarter, and then Georgia maybe is able to pull away. I just want to see Tennessee fight. I want to see Tennessee fight against Georgia. I want to see this team fight against some of the best teams in the SEC. And I think that Tennessee is going to be able to pull off some upsets. I expect this team to get to nine wins this year. I don't know if nine wins is going to be good enough to get to a New Year's Six Bowl game or whatnot, but... This is a football program that I'm really high on. I'm really excited to watch. And I think that they are heading in the right direction. However, I think that this is going to be a pretty big year for Josh Heupel. And not in the sense that he's going to get fired or anything. But I'm just saying that this would be big if he's able to get the 9, maybe 10 wins. It would be a huge momentum boost for the Tennessee program. And I believe that it can happen because when you have a star quarterback like Hendon Hooker, he's able to elevate not only the players around them, but he kind of boosts the morale of the whole entire program. There are many people who are now starting to hop aboard of the Hendon Hooker Heisman hype train and welcome aboard. But you guys let me know how you're feeling about the Vols this year. Could Tennessee potentially end up making the New Year's Six Bowl game? I definitely feel it's possible, but you let me know down in the comment section down below how you're feeling about Tennessee football this upcoming college football season. How good will the Cincinnati Bengals defense be in 2022? This was a really underrated defense last season. And I said it so many times, and yet... Nobody really realized it until the playoffs. I'm really excited about what this defense can do this year. Because not only do I expect the Cincinnati Bengals to have the best offense in the league, but maybe this defense could perform at a top 10 level. You have Sam Hubbard, Trey Hendrickson, one of the better pass rushing duels that we have in the league. Sam Hubbard had seven and a half sacks last year. Trey Hendrickson had 14 sacks. Trey Hendrickson is quietly becoming one of the best edge rushers in the game. Multiple seasons of having double-digit sacks. It's only a matter of time before we start regarding him in that conversation of maybe being one of the best in the game. Then, when it comes to the interior of the defensive line, you have defensive tackle DJ Reader. Phenomenal in the run game. 43 tackles. He had three tackles for loss and also had two sacks last season. B.J. Hill, five and a half sacks, 50 tackles, six tackles for loss. The Bengals got really good play out of their defensive line last year. But a rookie that I'm really excited to see for Cincinnati this season 
is defensive lineman Zachary Carter. He was the Bengals' third-round pick, hailing from the University of Florida. Last year for the Gators football program, he had eight sacks. And uh, he can also play defensive tackle, but he can also play DN as well. And I like him better at D tackle because he has very quick feet, good hands. He has a good amount of pass rush moves. And I think this year we're going to see him come in as a rotational pass rusher. He's going to come in when it comes to third down situations and obvious passing situations. And I think he has potential to end up being a really good interior pass rusher for the Cincinnati Bengals. At linebacker, you have Logan Wilson and Jermaine Pratt returning. Last year, we saw both Pratt and Wilson elevate their play in the playoffs. Jermaine Pratt had the game ceiling interception in the wild card win against the Las Vegas Raiders when he caught that interception, fourth and goal, to seal the game for Cincinnati, which helped them move on to the divisional round, which they would end up going on to beat Tennessee. Logan Wilson had 100 tackles last year, which led the team. He also had four interceptions and four pass deflections. He is really starting to become one of the better all-around linebackers in this game. Jermaine Pratt was third on the team in tackles with 91. He had two pass deflections and an interception. The linebacker play for Cincinnati is going to be even better this season because last year they played really solid. But in the playoffs, they really elevated their game. They really took that next step. And hopefully, they can continue the hot streak that they had in the postseason last year. And it can carry over into the 2022 NFL season. At cornerback, you have Tredobio Wuzie, who was your best corner. He had 14 pass deflections, two interceptions. Eli Apple, he's somebody who gets a lot of hate. And I think he's overhated in a sense. I understand he gave up the game-losing interception, well, the game-losing touchdown in the Super Bowl, but let's not act like he was getting burnt all that game. As a matter of fact, Eli Apple had some good moments. Yes, he had some really bad moments, especially when he was trash-talking on social media and he ended up getting burnt. However, he does possess some really good traits, And it's a big reason why Cincinnati brought him back on the one-year deal. If Eli Apple wasn't good, he wouldn't be playing for Cincinnati right now. He would still be a free agent. So obviously, Cincinnati feels that he brings some value to this defense. And that's why they're giving him a one-year extension. And also, he's not that bad as a lot of people try to make him out to be. He had some big moments. He had a tip pass against Kansas City that ended up winning the game for them. Ended up being an interception. So, I mean... He did have a couple of bad moments, but that's not, let's not, let's not try to act as if Eli Apple was just completely terrible all year, okay? Even Jalen Ramsey had some moments last season where he got burnt. Heck, he got burnt in the Super Bowl, so every cornerback has their days. Eli Apple probably had the best season of his career with Cincinnati in 2021, and it may not be saying much because you may look at Eli Apple and say, oh, JT, well, I mean, it's not as if he had any good seasons prior to last year. Understandable, but I just feel as if the hate for Eli Apple, it's kind of a little bit dragged out at this point it's kind of as if people are beating a dead horse Eli Apple is not that bad I just had to say that because too many people try to make it seem like Eli Apple is just this garbage cornerback who has no business starting if he was garbage Cincinnati wouldn't have re-signed him to a one-year deal go back and watch some of the tape he had some games where he got burnt but he also had some good moments as well rookie cornerback out of Nebraska Tam Taylor Britt was drafted in the second round. Cincinnati Cincinnati actually traded up to get him. And he potentially could start over Eli Apple this season. But I think that he's probably going to end up taking this year, taking the back seat. Then when Eli Apple's contract expires at the end of this year, he'll end up stepping into that starting outside corner role. He is a super athletic cornerback and he's aggressive. There are not too many cornerbacks that are willing to come up and lay a hit on players nowadays like Cam Britt is. Cam Britt is a rare cornerback in a sense that he's not afraid to hit. And when I say hit, I'm not talking about your normal ankle biters. I'm not talking about going low. He will really get up with you and really try to lay a smack into you. And I love that out of 
Cam Britt. Because there are too many defensive backs who are coming into the game now who only care about covering. They don't care about stopping the run. They don't care about tackling. They just... They just do enough to get by. Cam Britt is going to lay the wood to you when he gets the chance. And I love that. However, his aggressiveness does get him in troubles in time. If you go back and you watch his tape in Nebraska, he had some moments where he got beat on double moves, where he was just simply too aggressive. He got caught lacking in play action, too busy, can the Key in the run, which ended up resulting in him being out of position and getting beaten over the top. However, he does have very good recovery speed, but he needs to learn how to play more discipline. And when he learns how to play more discipline with his aggressive style of play, he's going to end up being a really good cornerback for Cincinnati. He also has the ability to play safety. He can play slot corner. You can move him around in many different positions and I think that the Cincinnati Bengals defensive coordinator is going to have a lot of fun with Cam Taylor Britt then you have rookie DB out of Michigan Daxton Hill who Cincinnati took in the first round of this past year's NFL draft super athletic defensive back with great twitch great awareness he understands what's going on he's really exceptional when it comes to anticipating routes then he can line up anywhere, anywhere as well. We talk about the versatility that Cam Taylor Britt has. Destin Hill, I don't know how Cincinnati's going to use him. Because when you have somebody with this kind of skill set, you just have to put him on the field and just say, go play. So you're going to put him in that slot over Mike Hilton, who Mike Hilton is one of the best slot cornerbacks, if not the best slot corner in the league? Or are you going to put him back there at safety? Is he going to be somewhat of a hybrid linebacker or nickel and dime packages? How does Cincinnati plan on using Daxton Hill? We don't really know. At the moment, on the death chart, according to ourlens.com, he's listed as their nickelback. But I don't really understand how Cincinnati plans to utilize him because he's so good and you can put him pretty much anywhere. It's just really hard to find a role for him when you have so much talent already on defense. He also could play outside cornerback if you need him to. Then you have Jesse Bates, Von Bell at the safety position. I know that Jesse Bates currently is at odds with Cincinnati trying to get a new deal done. I already made a video about it on the JT Sports Podcast. Make sure you guys go ahead and check that out. But... Even if Jesse Bates and Cincinnati can't come to terms on a long-term deal, I strongly doubt that Jesse Bates is going to sit out this year simply for the fact that it doesn't benefit Jesse Bates to sit out. I understand that he doesn't want to play on the franchise tag. Nobody wants to play on the franchise tag because if you do and you get injured, then it negatively affects you when it comes to future contract negotiations, whether that be with the Bengals or in free agency. But... I do expect him to play this year. I would be extremely surprised if he doesn't. You also have Von Bell back there, which he had a pretty solid role with Cincinnati last year. I think he was kind of underrated. Not enough people talk about what he did with Cincinnati in 2021. Then you have rookie safety Tyson Anderson out of Toledo, who could potentially be Von Bell or Jesse Bates' replacement. He's a 6'2", 209-pound safety he is really good inside the box, especially when he has to line up against tight ends. I think he's phenomenal in that role. For Toledo, he played in big nickel packages majority of the time. That's where he had the most success as. So for Cincinnati, if Von Bell ends up leaving and they don't want to resign him or they can't resign Jesse Bates, I think we could see Tyson Anderson slide into one of those starting safety spots next year. However, he'll probably have a little bit of a role on special teams and he may come in if, God forbid, one of them gets injured. But I'm really excited for what this Cincinnati Bengals defense could do this year because this was one of the most underrated defenses in the NFL. They stepped up big time when it mattered the most, and they made play after play in big moments. Not only that, but their defensive coordinator deserves a lot of credit. I'm not going to try to pronounce his name, but he is really good at making adjustments. You go back to the AFC Championship game, Against the Kansas City Chiefs, Kansas City was just running up the score. And many people thought, okay, this is the end of the road for Cincinnati, right? 
Well, at the halftime, they come out and they hold Patrick Mahomes to 55 passing yards and two interceptions. In the first half, Patrick Mahomes was going off. In the second half, he had no touchdowns and only had 55 passing yards. Unbelievable. This defensive coordinator is going to be a head coach sooner rather than later if he keeps up the performance because this is a really good coaching staff. Not just him, but Zach Taylor in general. Zach Taylor deserves a lot of credit. I don't think he gets enough praise for the job he did last season getting Cincinnati to the Super Bowl, but the staff that he assembled is really good and they're really smart. They pay attention to the smart details in the game. And when you look at the defense of Cincinnati with how good they were last year against the run, that's not only going to improve, but their pass rush is going to improve also with the addition of Zachary Carter. Zachary Carter, man, I'm expecting him to have at least three, four sacks this year. He's not going to be a full-time starter, but he is going to be really good in situations where you need him on the field to help against the pass. When you need an extra boost in the pass rush, he's going to give you that. I like the addition of rookies Cam Taylor Britt. They have a lot of potential. Same thing with defensive back Daxton Hill. This is a defense that is building something special because their defensive backs have a lot of versatility. You can play them pretty much anywhere on the field. And I'm really interested in seeing how Cincinnati continues to build this defense in the near future. Are they going to continue to add more versatile players who can play more than one position and can be lined up on pretty much anywhere on the defense? I'm really excited to see, but I'm expecting this defense to pick up from where they left off last year. At worst, they still should be a top 15, top 13 defense in the league, but at best, This defense could be almost as good as the offense. This could be a top 10 defense this year. So let me know how you guys are feeling about the Bengals defense going into the 2022 NFL season. This was one of the more underrated units in the NFL this year. Well, last season, I'm really high on them, and I'm excited to see what the Bengals can do this year on the defensive side of the football. The last thing I want to talk about before we end up this episode Why Houston Texans fans should be excited about rookie running back Damian Pierce. They drafted Pierce in the fourth round out of Florida. He's 5'10", 218 pounds. And this is a dude. If you needed a definition of what a grown man looks like, they will have Damian Pierce photo right next to it in the definition. This is a grown man. He doesn't have great speed or elusiveness, but he gets downhill north south and puts people on their you know what and the only way to really stop damian pierce is to slow him down before he gets going because once he gets going and he gets his legs up under him and he gets into the open field (laughs) good luck people like damian pierce were the reason why i never wanted to play defense imagine you're a defensive back right you're a safety And Damian Pierce is running at you full speed. Let's say he's already hit 18, 19 miles per hour and he's pushing 20. What would you do? I know what I'm doing. I'm getting the hell out of the way. (laughs) Nah, seriously. I'll try to slow him down. But that's really the only thing I could do is try to slow him down. You try to go for his legs. Okay, good luck. You try to hit him up high. Oh, that's a suicide wish. And it really surprises me that Dan Mullen barely barely utilized him. I guess we see why Dan Mullen is unemployed right now at the moment and why he's no longer a head coach. You have this behemoth of a man, and yet he barely got more than, what, 10 touches a game? He only has seven games where he averaged more than 10 carries. That's unbelievable. This is a freak. I don't know what God was thinking when he created Damian Pierce. But if he was trying to make an X-Men or a Wolverine, he did a pretty good job of coming close to it. Because Damian Pierce, the way he's built, he looks like somebody who has never missed a day in the gym. He's always in the gym every day. He, You ever met somebody who has that bodybuilder physique? They're just, they're just big for no reason. That's Damian Pierce. This dude is a freak. I don't know what he was doing as a kid. He probably was eating his fruits and vegetables. I don't know what. But this dude is a massive human being. And he's a freak. 
And not only that, but it, I have rarely saw any games where when Damian Pierce got carries, where he wasn't falling for extra yardage. Very seldom do you see somebody bring Damian Pierce down off the first initial contact. It normally takes at least two to three people to bring this guy down. I don't know if you guys saw the play against Florida State that went viral, but he ran through one guy, his helmet came off, and he pretty much carried the whole entire FSU defense. Literally, go back and watch it. The dude's helmet flew off, still kept running. Unbelievable. This is a monster. What Houston has in the running back room, to me, is very similar to Nick Chubb. Nick Chubb was a very violent runner coming out of Georgia. He didn't have breakaway speed. He didn't have a little looseness, but he was really good getting the ball, getting north-south, and getting downhill, and that's Damian Pierce. Damian Pierce reminds me a lot of Nick Chubb. Did you know that Damian Pierce averaged a touchdown every seven touches in 2021? Think about that. For every seven times he touched the football, He scored a touchdown. That's unbelievable. And I think that he's going to end up becoming the lead back in Houston sooner rather than later. The only two backs he really has to beat out is Rex Burkhead, who's more of a pass-catching back. And then you have Marlon Mack. And I love Marlon Mack. Marlon Mack is one of my favorite players in the league. It's just that he's in a tough situation because Damian Pierce has the potential to be better. And it's kind of funny The way that Marlon Mack lost his job against Indianapolis, people think that he just got outright beaten out by Jonathan Taylor. That didn't happen. He got injured. And then Jonathan Taylor took over, and then it pretty much was wraps from there. So hopefully Marlon Mack doesn't completely get phased out of the offense, but Damian Pierce starting off is definitely going to be their goal line back. He's going to be their short yardage back on short yardage situations. And he's eventually going to become their lead back through the course of the 2021, well, 2022 NFL season, excuse me. And if you're somebody who plays fantasy football, I definitely would encourage you to drive Damian Pierce if you're able to get him in the later rounds and stash him. Because around the middle of the upcoming NFL season, that's where you're going to start to see him running wild. And Houston's run game was not that good. And they didn't have too many backs that were good getting yards after contact. Yards after contact is what Damian Pierce excels at. I'm so excited to watch him play this year. Last year for Florida, he had 100 carries for 475 rushing yards. Well, 574 rushing yards. He averaged 5.7 yards per carry. He had 216 receiving yards. And he had a total of 16 total touchdowns. 13 on the ground and 3 in the passing game. And I also think that he may be a better receiver than what we may be giving him credit for. It's not as if he had a lot of opportunities to catch the football last year for Florida because they didn't really give him as many opportunities to be on the field as he should be. So for Houston, he's going to end up becoming their complete three down back. And I think it's going to happen sooner rather than later. I hope that he ends up doing it by the time week one rolls around because I plan on driving him in every single fantasy football league. But I think that Damian Pierce has potential to end up being the best rookie running back this season. You look at everybody in their situations that they're currently in. Brees Hall has to, has to share reps with Michael Carter, with the New York Jets. You're looking at Kenneth Walker with Seattle. He has to deal with Chris Carson, with Sharp Penny. So out of all of the rookie running backs right now, Damian Pierce would probably have my vote of having the highest chance of winning Offensive Rookie of the Year. I think that Damian Pierce is going to end up being the best rookie running back by the end of this upcoming NFL season. And I'm hoping that he ends up getting the majority of the workload sooner rather than later. I hope we don't have to wait until week 10 or week 11 in the year for Damian Pierce to really get things rolling. I just hope that Houston just goes ahead and they do the right thing and start him week one. 
and just allow him to just get the bulk load of the carries. Allow him to get 15 carries. Marlon Mack probably gets about six or seven, and then maybe Rex Burkhead comes in for a couple of downs, and you give him four plays. But Damian Pierce definitely should be the bell cow in this Houston offense. I am a huge fan of Damian Pierce. I'm excited for what he can do this year. Let me know how you guys are feeling about Damian Pierce down in the comment section down below. And I appreciate you guys for listening to this episode of the JT Sports Podcast. Make sure that you check out the JT Sports Podcast on every single podcasting platform. Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify Podcasts, wherever you get your podcasts from, the JT Sports Podcast is available.